Welcome back for day 10 of the Blender Basics Bootcamp. This is the final video. You made it all the way through. Today, we're gonna tweak the lights to make our scene really pop, talk about the difference between the two rendering engines that ship with Blender, and finally, we'll render out our animation. Let's finish this up. My name is Chris Folia. I'm your Stream Scholar. Welcome to Stream School. At this point, I'm just gonna make some final tweaks to my scene and you can either follow along, make your own tweaks, or just skip ahead to the part where we take this animation and save it out as a video file. But anyway, I'm gonna go to the top of the screen and click on the layout tab. I'm gonna re-enable the screencast keys just so y'all can see what I'm typing in the lower right hand corner. Then I'm gonna go to my camera view and turn that into a rendered preview mode. So let's just take a look at this and figure out what tweaks we want to make. So if I look at this and I'm 100% honest with myself, this image is pretty dark and the star of our image, the trophy cup, doesn't really stand out. If I squint my eyes, it honestly kind of blends into the background. It's really low contrast. So to fix that, we wanna brighten this trophy cup up. And if we zoom in, you're gonna notice that most of the color on this trophy cup comes from our background reflection image, or our HDRI. So I'm gonna brighten that up. And yes, I know, we spent most of this tutorial series darkening and suppressing that world image, but I'm gonna brighten it up anyway. So I'm gonna go over to the world tab, and here I'm gonna change the strength to about 0.35. And just like that, you're gonna notice our trophy seems a lot happier and more welcoming, because it's just so much brighter and nicer looking. Unfortunately, brightening the world also brightened everything else. So to compensate for that, I'm gonna select my wood, Go down to the node editor, make sure I'm on the object dropdown, and here I'm gonna click on the node group for the material, hit tab to go into it, and I'm just gonna adjust the nice RGB curves that we have to darken it a little bit just to make the trophy pop off of the background a bit more. I think that looks pretty cool. Don't wanna go too far or else our shadows are gonna sort of disappear into it. Then next, the reflections are also way too bright now because the world image that we just brightened up made them a little bit too apparent. So I'm gonna click on the glass, and here I'm gonna change the factor down from 0.015 to about 0 0.0075, and I think that looks a whole lot nicer. Next, you'll notice that the sides of the image are primarily taken up by these empty trophy cabinet segments, and we could take the time to model additional stuff and add that extra detail to the scene, but I'd much rather just hide it. So to do that, I'm gonna make our primary segment a little bit wider. So for that, I'm gonna click on the trophy cabinet, hit tab to go into edit mode, one for vertex select, and on the one segment that I actually can edit, I'm gonna select the far right hand side, hit GX, and that'll widen up the entire thing. I think somewhere about right there works. So I'm gonna tab out of edit mode, and now I'm just gonna hit GX, and I'm looking at the rendered preview, by the way, when I'm moving this, because the wireframe view over here in the long run honestly doesn't really matter. So I'm gonna move this over until it looks about right to me in the rendered preview. Just wanna find a good balance here. And I think that looks pretty cool. So finally, you're gonna notice that our reflections are pretty blurry. And if you remember back in the lighting video that we did, I used the low resolution world image. I used the 2K texture instead of the 8K one. So I'm gonna go over to my world settings and where it says ballroom 2K, I'm gonna swap that out for my 8K texture. So I'll click the folder go to my textures folder and I'm gonna choose my ballroom 8K. And just a friendly reminder why we did that in the first place, the 2K texture is six megabytes and the 8K texture is 93, <laughs> yikes. So that's why I like to work with the lower resolution ones first. I'm gonna hit open image and that's gonna come in. But you're gonna notice that it's a little bit pixelated. And that's not because of the image, that's because of the render settings we have. So I'm gonna zoom in on this jagged edge Go over to the render settings by clicking the camera icon, go all the way down to where it says indirect lighting and click on that. And here I'm gonna change the cube map size from 512 to 2048 and now our reflection is a whole lot sharper and it looks so much nicer. So here, I think I'm just gonna change one last thing and that's gonna be the animation. So I'm gonna go to the end of my animation Go to the top orthographic view, and I just want to zoom this in and make it a more subtle animation. I don't think we need to get this wide on our trophy cabinet. So I'm going to hit G, Z, Z to zoom my camera in some, like so. I'm going to hit R to rotate it, like that. Then I'm going to hit I 
location and rotation to set that keyframe. Now, that being a more subtle animation, if I hit play, this is moving painstakingly slow. So I'm gonna take that last keyframe and I'm gonna drag it back to about frame 100 and now our animation is gonna move a lot faster. I think that's a pretty nice speed. So to compensate for that, I'm gonna make sure that my animation ends at frame 100 rather than 250 now. So in the lower right hand corner right here where it says start and end, I'm gonna click on end and set that to 100. So now if I hit space, it's gonna start and stop at the right place. So now I think would be a good time to discuss the differences between the two different rendering engines that ship with Blender. So if I scroll up on my render properties here, you'll notice the rendering engine by default is set to Eevee, and that is Blender's newer rendering engine. And it's a rasterization engine. By that, I mean it uses the same tricks and techniques as your standard game engine, like Unreal Engine or Unity. And because of that, it's extremely fast. I can rotate around and it's almost like it's completely in real time other than the stuff like resolving the soft shadows. And that is the primary benefit of the EV rendering engine. It's just extremely fast because it's literally using what's basically a game rendering engine. Now, in contrast to that, we have the second rendering engine. It's called Cycles and it's an actual path tracer. By that, I mean it uses ray tracing, it bounces rays throughout the scene to create really realistic lighting. It actually bounces light around the scene and you get all these beautiful color bounces and shadows and actually accurate reflections. So I'm gonna switch over to Cycles now to show you what that looks like by clicking this drop down and going to Cycles. So as it loads up, you're gonna notice that it starts out super grainy and then over time it bounces more rays and with that extra data, it now resolves a much sharper image. Now, if I put a Cycles final render up next to an Eevee final render, you'll notice the Cycles render looks a whole lot more realistic, but that comes at a cost. Now, if I put the render times up, you're gonna notice Cycles takes a whole lot longer to render than Eevee. So for me personally, in most of the work that I do these days, all of my digital sets for my stream, motion media, stuff like that, I pretty much exclusively use Eevee. And I'd honestly recommend using Eevee if you're doing anything stylized, doing motion media stuff, or don't need to go the extra 10% to make it 100% photorealistic. Now, if you need to make something that's absolutely 100% photorealistic, all the bells and whistles, the bounced lighting, the cool color bounces, the really nice accurate reflections, then I would recommend using Cycles. Now, for this scene in particular, I honestly like the way that Cycles looks a whole lot better. The reflections and the lighting just look so much more believable to me. So I'm gonna continue using Cycles for this scene, but if you want the speed that Eevee offers and you like the way it looks, you can stick with that if you want to. So for the next portion of this video, I'm gonna share some settings that can speed Cycles up a little bit. So here, I'm gonna go down to the uh, sampling tab right here, and you're gonna notice by default, the viewport's only set to 32. That's why it stopped, why there were still tons of little individual bright pixels here. So we can turn that up to about 256, for instance, and it'll continue to resolve. Now, generally, back in the traditional good old days, um, you would used to have to do tons and tons of samples, like thousands of samples to get a fully resolved image. But thanks to the advances in technology and algorithms and math and stuff, I guess, uh, we now have denoising as an option. What that means is if I click this little denoising dropdown and turn on viewport denoising, you'll notice instead of starting pixelated and getting less and less pixelated, now it starts splotchy and gets less and less splotchy. And with enough data, the denoiser can completely eliminate noise, which means that you don't need to use nearly as many samples as you used to, and your frames are gonna take just a fraction of the time to render out. So I'm also gonna turn on render denoising so it actually denoises my final render, but that's one way you can speed up your renders. Another way is to use hardware acceleration. So if you look at the device dropdown, by default, it's set to CPU. You can also use your graphics card to render and it's a whole lot faster. So by default, you're probably not gonna see your graphics card in this dropdown. If that's the case, you can go to Edit, Preferences, go to the System tab, and here you have a whole bunch of options. Now, if you have a regular NVIDIA GeForce card that's not RTX, you're gonna want to use CUDA. 
If you have an RTX card, you're gonna wanna use optics so you can take advantage of that ray tracing hardware. If you have an AMD graphics card, you're gonna wanna use OpenCL because that's the only one that's gonna work with it. So under optics in CUDA, I don't actually know about OpenCL because I've never had an AMD graphics card before. You'll notice that you can have both your graphics card and your processor checked. And that's actually a pretty recent addition to Blender. It's so nice now to be able to use my beast of a processor with my beast of a graphics card. It just improves the render time that much more. It used to be you had to choose one or the other, which kind of sucked. So here I'm gonna exit out of the settings, go to the drop down, and I'm gonna choose GPU compute. And you're gonna notice that's gonna be a whole lot faster. Look at that. Beautiful. At this point, I think we're ready to render out the final animation. So for that, I'm gonna go to the output settings or output properties, which is this little printer icon right here. I'm gonna scroll down to the output, and here where it says file format, you're gonna notice the default is a PNG image. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Chris, that's just an image file. I want to render out an animation. Well, it just so happens that the ideal way to render an animation out of Blender is to use an image sequence. And what I mean by that is literally tons and tons and tons and tons of images. Literally one image file per frame of your animation. Now, the reason for this, if you think about it for a second, well, if you, if you want to render out a video file, these frames take a decent amount of time. Sometimes with a more complicated scene, if you're doing a realistic scene, they can take 10 to 20 minutes per frame. At Pixar, they've had frames that have taken up to 50 hours for one frame. So if you're rendering out a video file and Blender just says, well, I'm gonna crash halfway through, you have to restart that entire render from scratch. And that would be devastating. Or alternatively, if you just wanna take a break and pause your render to go play some games with some friends or something, if you're rendering out a video file, you now have to restart that render completely from scratch. While if you're rendering an image sequence, every single time it finishes a frame, it saves that frame as an image file. So if Blender crashes, you already have all the images it completed, you can just pick up where it left off. If you wanna pause and go hang out with friends or play some games with friends or something, you can just cancel the render, close it down. You have all of those files already saved on your hard drive. You can just pick up where it left off. So to actually render out this image sequence, we have a few different options. First of all, the default is a PNG. If you're doing like some intense VFX work or something where you need some additional color grading depth, you're probably gonna wanna use a higher bit depth image like an open EXR. I honestly don't know a bunch about that though. In all of my professional and personal work, uh, I've literally never needed anything other than a PNG for my own personal work. So anyway, to actually export this image sequence, I'm gonna hit the folder. I'm gonna choose a place on my hard drive. I'm gonna choose trophy out, and then I'm gonna make a brand new empty folder called trophy render final. You can see a few different attempts from different takes of this tutorial I did. I'm gonna go into that folder, and here I'm gonna name it trophy render dot pound sign, pound sign, pound sign. I guess the kids are calling them hashtags these days, dot PNG. So on render, the software knows to replace these hashtags with the frame number. So for instance, this is gonna be trophy render dot zero zero one dot PNG, trophy render dot zero zero two dot PNG, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I did three pound signs because I'm rendering hundreds of frames, which goes up to three number places. So anyway, I'm gonna hit accept. And now the last step here is gonna be to hit render, render animation. It'll pop up the render window and here it'll take its time. It'll render out each individual frame one at a time and it'll save those on your hard drive in the folder that you designated. Now I already did my homework and rendered out 50 frames earlier cause I don't wanna sit here and make you wait. So to actually take that image sequence now, the one that I just showed you, and turn that into a video file, all you have to do is hit, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and save this really quick actually. Uh, T2, hell yeah. You go to File, New, and instead of choosing a general file type, you're gonna wanna choose a video editing file type. Here you can hit Add, Image slash Sequence, and find your image sequence. Mine's gonna be right here. I'm gonna hit A to select all of the images and I'm gonna hit add image strip. So now if I hit space to play, we have our beautiful image sequence playing back just like that. Cool. 
Now you're gonna notice it gets cut off and that's because the default frame range in Blender is from one to 250. So we just need to change the frame range down to whatever our image sequence is. I personally have 50 images here. So I'm gonna go to the bottom right and change the end of my animation to 50. Hit enter. And now if I play it back, it'll play through and it will end at the right spot. So to actually save this as a video now, rather than an image sequence, go down to the output settings here. And where it says file format, you're gonna to wanna to change that to FFmpeg video. Now, if you want this to be an MP4 file, just change the container to MPEG4. And the audio codec, one that works really well with MPEG4 I've found is AAC. And you can add audio to this the exact same way we just added the image strip. Now, if you're making like a stream overlay or something and you need transparency in your video, you're probably gonna wanna use a WebM file. So to do that, you can go to the container and set that to WebM and go to the video codec and set that to WebM slash VP9. Then an audio codec that I found that works well for that is Vorbis. So anyway, I'm gonna keep mine as an MP4. And to export this, I'm just gonna choose a location to save it by clicking the folder. I'm gonna put this one right here and call this trophy animation dot mp4 hit enter hit accept and now all i have to do is hit render render animation and this will go a whole lot faster this time because it's literally just taking those images and saving them into a video file so here if i open up my windows explorer go to where i saved it and double click on it i have a fully exported beautiful trophy animation and at this point that's it, we're done. You made it all the way to the end and I think you deserve a massive pat on your back and a big congratulations and a job well done. And that's the entire series. If you wanna share your trophy image or animation, I'd love to see it. I made a specific channel for that in my community discord, link in the description. I also, again, really wanna encourage you to take this further. Keep playing with it and make your scene truly yours. If you found this series useful, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell for more tutorials and freebies this year. And if you wanna come hang out with me live, I'm live at least every Friday over at youtube.com slash oraclefish. Also, if you wanna download my exam Sample files or just support what I do here on the channel, make sure you check out my brand new Patreon. Link in the description. Until next time, my name is Chris Folia. I'm your stream scholar, and the class is out. Oh